Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce our next keynote uh, speaker, uh, Stephen Levy, who is the uh, uh, main technology writer for Newsweek magazine uh, and author of the book Hackers, uh, which is a very interesting read. You should probably pick it up. Uh, details on a lot of the uh, history that led to the, uh, the Boston concentration of uh, computer security industry and the whole hacking scene and how that kind of came together. Um, well, I'll give it up for Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. You folks all having a good conference? Great, great. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to be here uh, to talk to you today. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, again, I want to thank uh, the folks at, at Source for inviting me and uh, thank you for, um, I hope, listening. It actually has been sort of a weird week for me. I posted uh, this column this week. Uh, it ran in Newsweek uh, this past weekend and ran in the Washington Post uh, on Wednesday. And I got a, a lot of strange reaction from the blogosphere about it. Basically, the column, I don't know if any of you saw the, the, some of the reaction, was about how um, I lost my review unit of the MacBook Air that Apple had, had lent me. Um, now, which I, I actually have to say, I, I take responsibility for it, but not, not too much. How can you blame someone for losing something that's called air, right? So, you know, this is the computer. Does anyone have one, incidentally, out there? The, 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 the whole, the, there's no, no air here? You know, the air's out of the room? No yeah, okay, we, well, I know you guys don't put on airs. But, uh, you know, this is the computer that you've probably seen, which is, you know, so thin that you could put it in an envelope. And my test unit, of course, my rigorous test lab, we did put it in an envelope and it did fit. And I actually even slid it under the door because it looks small enough to slide under my office door. And I did that and I documented by video and did the review and was hanging on to it doing some further testing. When uh, I, I looked around one day, I wanted to take it into work, and the MacBook Air was, was gone. I, I couldn't see it anywhere. It's usually sitting uh, by the coffee tables where I left it so I could sort of sit with it you know, on, my, on my lap while I, I watch TV. And uh, the power cord was there, the power brick, so I figured it must be around there somewhere. And I looked all over the apartment. It's pretty hard to locate this thing in the apartment because the profile is so thin. So I ripped the apartment you know, totally to shreds, couldn't find it, and sort of retraced where it could have possibly been. And I really concluded that I really couldn't have had it lost. The odds were small that uh, it, it was stolen somewhere, though not impossible because I don't remember 100% where it was. And I, I finally devised a theory as to what happened to the MacBook Air. Now remember I said the MacBook Air was stored around the coffee table, and the coffee table is a big repository in my house for all the newspapers and magazines uh, that, that collect during the week, and especially on Sunday when the New York Times comes in, the, the pile gets pretty big there. And this was like on a Wednesday, and I hadn't seen it for a few days, so I figured, you know, what might have happened was these things accumulate, and at a certain point during Sunday afternoon, my wife really gets disgusted with all the clutter in the thing, and just grabs all the newspapers and magazines with two, two, two of her arms, and, and walks it out, out of the apartment and down the hall, and dumps it all in a big recycling bin uh, down in the, in the compactor room. And this is what I concluded happened to my MacBook Air. And I you know, uh, posted this thing, and, uh, and there's been a lot of comments on this uh, uh, column on the blogosphere, and very few of them were flattering. Uh, a lot of them talked about you know, what a slob I was, and I couldn't take care of things, and, you know, Apple should, you know, you know just get me for it, you know, though I have to say my employer is, is going to pay for it. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife was actually pretty unhappy with the column. She insists, well, let me put this way, she doesn't subscribe to my theory of how the, the MacBook got thrown out. Fortunately, Elliot Spitzer has rescued me, because I, I, I told her, I said, listen, you might be upset that I blamed you for throwing out the MacBook, but I'm not asking you to stand beside me while I explain why I'm going to prostitutes. So, uh, you know, and she admitted it, was, it wasn't that bad there. And I, maybe my favorite comment uh, on, on a blog was on the, the fake Steve Jobs blog. Did any of you ever read that? It's, it's really a, you know, a, a great blog where a guy pretends to be Steve Jobs. He's actually pretty good at it. And here's what he said. He, he did a posting. The headline was, um, Stephen Levy steals MacBook Air, claims it's lost. 
uh, Stephen, you know, you could just tell us you wanted an extension on the loan, and we would have known what you meant, and we'd be okay with that. Really. Also, pick up that apartment of yours. The place is a mess. So, by the way, I haven't heard from the real Steve Jobs about the missing uh, MacBook Air, but the first person at, at Apple I did tell about just couldn't stop laughing when I told her. So, uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, ridicule from all fronts. And, oh, in, in case you were wondering, and with this crowd, I'll bet you were wondering, uh, the Lost Air did not contain any off-the-record talks with Google or credit card numbers from DSL Shoe Warehouse. Uh, it did not contain the VA's master list of social security numbers and birth dates of 26 million veterans. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. All that stuff is in my other computer, which I left on the train last night. But and anyway, it, it really is uh, great to be here in, in Cambridge. This is a place that has a lot of meaning to me uh, because you know, uh, a lot of great things have happened here in my reporting life, and a lot of them just not far at all from this hotel. And of course, I'm talking about MIT, and in particular, uh, two buildings at MIT, uh, only one of which is standing now. And one of the buildings... even work there. Uh, it's one of those you know, two, two ten-story towers uh, over there with uh, a lot of great stuff. And the other is the legendary Building 20, which you can't see because it was demolished a, a few years ago. Now, it was in these two buildings that uh, a paradox was born. And it's a paradox that's something that you folks in the computer security world see all the time. And, and the heart of this paradox is a very charged word, and that word is hacker. So for well over 20 years, I've been involved in trying to chronicle what might be called hackerism. And I'll avoid saying I mythologized it, but looking back to the origins of, of, of hackers, uh, it does seem almost mythic. And the practice of hackers, as we know it, uh, goes back now for about 50 years, which is kind of an astonishing number when, when you think about it. Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so let me uh, get back to this paradox which I mentioned. And I'll bet a lot of you have thought about it. So here it is. The activity of computing becomes more valuable pe to people to the degree that it is open and accessible. The more open computers and networks are, the easier they are to use, the more useful they are, and the more they mean to us. So much so that because of this accessibility and openness, computers have changed the way we live and deeply changed our culture. But also, as all of you know, there is a dark side to openness and accessibility when it comes to computers and networks. Openness leads to exploitation by pranksters, thieves, spammers, snoops, and malfeasance in general. And that makes computers, of course, less pleasant, less inviting, less useful, and in some cases it makes them an outright menace. Now, you know all this, but I, I'm, I just stuck at how profound this contradiction is. This, uh, it's so solidly baked into the very paradigm of computing. It's really in the DNA of digital culture. And I think that paradox really began right here in Cambridge with the original hackers. Now, when I use the word hackers, uh, I really have to be perfectly clear here that I'm not talking about the bad guys. And I assume you folks know about all these distinctions here. But I really am talking about the innovative wizards who may cross a line here and there, but by and large they had and they still have an overwhelmingly positive impact on the world at large. Now, before I talk about more about the original hackers and the paradox they thrust upon us. I, I want to share a bit how I came across hackers uh, in the first place. So uh, in the 70s, and I go back a while, uh, I was a freelance writer. And I wrote about a variety of topics that had nothing at all to do with science or computing or engineering or anything like that. I wrote about sports, I wrote about music, I wrote about murders, you know, the usual stuff that freelance writers write about. I'd interviewed Bob Marley and Bruce Springsteen and Julius Irving, but uh, with the exception of one story I did where I went and found Einstein's brain, which is a, another story I won't get into here, uh, nothing at all about science or, or technology. Now, all this changed in 1981 when I got an assignment for Rolling Stone magazine to write about computer hackers. Now, what did I know of hackers at that time? Nothing. I'd never even touched the computer. But a quick glance at stuff that had been written about it, and there wasn't much, you know, defined the term hacker in, in the following way. And if there, was a, there wasn't this exact definition, but it all boiled down to this. Hacker, 
antisocial nerd, by and large a loser who is addicted to computers. Okay, I thought I could do that story. Now, it's appropriate that I should bring up that stereotype today because in this morning's New York Times, I don't know if any of you saw it, there's an obituary of a former MIT professor named Joseph Weizenbaum. Uh, does that name, uh, mean anything to some of you? Uh, he was best known for creating this computer program called ELISA, which is sort of a, a faux artificial intelligence program where you can carry on a conversation with a computer and the computer would respond. It sort of worked like a therapist. He'd throw your uh, statement back at you in the form of a question. But a lot of people, you know, quite amazingly, you know, would interact with it and tell it their secrets. And it was almost as if they were talking to a therapist. Now, Weizenbaum also wrote a book, uh, which is pretty controversial on MIT, called Computer Power and Human Reason. And it has one very distinctive passage about hackers, particularly ones uh, at MIT. And it was one of the few things I could find when I was looking at the literature, surveying the literature, to learn about hackers before I set off uh, doing my story. So let me read you this passage here, which is not actually particularly flattering, that uh, Weizenbaum wrote in his book. Bright young men of disheveled appearance, often with sunken glowing eyes, can be seen sitting at computer consoles, their arms tensed and waiting to fire their fingers, already poised to strike at the buttons and keys on which their attention seems to be riveted as a gambler's on the rolling dice. When not so transfixed, they often sit at tables strewn with computer printouts over which they pour like possessed students at a Kabbalistic, of, of a Kabbalistic text. They work until they nearly drop 20, 30 hours at a time, their food, if they arrange it, is brought to them. Coffee, Coke, sandwiches. If possible, they sleep on cots near the printouts. Their rumpled clothes, their unwashed and unshaven faces, and their uncombed hair all testify that they are oblivious to their bodies and to the world in which they move. These are computer bums, compulsive programmers. Now, this is like straight out of Dostoevsky, right? I mean, you, you can't imagine a gloomier, more depressing group of people. I mean, Angelina Jolie should adopt them. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is what I thought I was going to encounter when I researched the story about computer hackers. And I flew out to California because uh, I targeted uh, some computers, uh, hackers at Stanford uh, to be the subject of my story. And before I went, I also uh, tapped a, a colleague uh, who used to work for, for Rolling Stone uh, and you know, knew a little bit about the computer world and asked him for a list of other people I could talk to, maybe outside of Stanford. And he gave me a list of uh, some people who were involved, I guess, in the early days of the personal computer industry, as well as some general wizards who were out there in California. So I got out there, and what I found actually blew away the stereotype. These people, by and large, were not the antisocial nerds that Weizenbaum was writing about, but they were, I, I saw them almost as creative adventurers of the mind. Their thought processes were utterly fascinating to me, and I found myself learning amazing things from the way they looked at the world. Plus, by and large, they were not depressed. Well, maybe a couple of them were, but you know, most of them were absolutely joyful at what they were doing. They were flushed with excitement about the things they were discovering and the things they were getting into on the computer. They felt empowered by programming. What's more, by pushing the envelope on computers, which were just then beginning to find their way out of the labs and you know, onto desktops, you know, these people were definitely on to something. Basically, it became clear to me that all of us were going to be empowered by computers, and these people were among the first to realize it. So I got really excited about these people. I wrote a story, which I hope uh, you know, did not stereotype them in, in the way that Weizenbaum did and, and some of the other things. And you know, I resolved right then and there that I was going to write more stories about these people and about this world. So I began a column for a computer magazine, Popular Computing, and I worked on stories for all sorts of magazines, uh, like about things like Steve Wozniak's Us Festival, which is a rock festival funded by uh, Apple's co-founder in 1982, the biggest one since Woods. Stock. Um, the development of the Macintosh I wrote about, I got in early uh, to see that, 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 you know, that team as they developed uh, the computer that some of you are, are using to this day, and things like the culture of computer bulletin boards. All sorts of thrilling things happened in, in the early 1980s. And of course, I got an Apple II for myself and became an early uh, proponent of word processing on the PC. 
And my girlfriend, who's now my wife, the person who threw out that MacBook Air, I think, uh, she also got one uh, at my insistence. And you know, just a couple months after we got it, it was kind of funny because uh, a computer magazine uh, heard that she was using a computer to do her work. She's a writer also. And they ran a, a, a story called Women in Computing, and they did a full-page picture of her in there, you know, not because she was involved in the computer industry or was programming, but because she simply used a computer, right, for word processing, and that was an unusual thing. And like now, it, it seems bizarre to think of it. It's almost like doing a story like women in pencils, and you would, you know, show someone like, you know, oh yes, this person uses a pencil. Uh, but back then, it was something pretty new and 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 novel. So around that time, as I was writing this stuff, a publisher asked me if I would be interested in writing a book about these creatures called hackers. And that sounded good to me. I had wanted to do a book for a while. Uh, the last proposal I had circulated was going to be uh, a study of cheesy nightclub singers. And for some reason, that didn't find favor with the publisher. So I was very eager to, you know, to get to work on something and thought this would be a, a good idea. So I got my book contract in mid-1982. And I first began the reporting with the idea of covering two things. I thought it would be a book in two sections. And one would be sort of historical, and the other would be based on the present day, you know, of uh, 1982, 1983, when I researched the book. And the first section would be about uh, the story of the Homebrew Computer Club. Uh, this was the group founded in March 1975 uh, because the people were very eager in Silicon Valley to build the first personal computer that you can get, which was called the Altair 880, and it was this thing you could spend $500 for, and you, it was a kit, you put it together, uh, it didn't do very much, but it was a computer that you could have, and this group of people were really excited about it, and among those people were Steve Wozniak, and uh, this group really hatched the personal computer industry, uh, because people like Steve and some others started companies from it, and it really set the template for not only the personal computer industry, but for startups in Silicon Valley and a lot of other things. So I thought that, that would be a great way to talk about where I thought it all began at least. Uh, and the second part would be something I thought was interesting happening at the time, which was uh, game hackers, uh, young people writing uh, software uh, that not only to please their friends, uh, as the early uh, homebrew people did, but uh, did it for commercial gain because that was getting to be a big industry. And that was something novel. So uh, I zeroed in this company in Core School, California, called Sierra Online. So I thought I would like, start with the beginning, the Homebrew Computer Club, and then you know do the second part, uh, talk about the consequences of success in this game company. But the more I interviewed people, the clearer it became to me the Homebrew Computer Club was not the beginning, but more like the second chapter of my story. Homebrew started the personal computer revolution, but the actual hacker culture, it turned out, and I, I found out the more I talked to people, had begun somewhat earlier. And, you know, the, the actual culture, you know, had gone to Homebrew and then set the tone for PCs, and as it turns out, later set the tone for the internet and the web. Now, these pioneers just didn't spring out from nowhere. They came from somewhere, and that somewhere was MIT. So a few months into my project, I realized my book would not just have two big sections, but three big sections. There'd still be a part on the Homebrew Computer Club, there'd still be the part about the game hackers uh, writing uh, personal computer software, and that would talk about the commercialization and things like that. But there would also be a first section, and it would turn out to be by far the most important section of, of that book, uh, and still resonant today, and that's about the hackers at MIT in the late 50s and early 60s. So that section is called True Hackers. And it talks about the people who really first used that term uh, to refer themselves, to themselves in that way in a, in a very proud way. And um, uh, those folks were, you know, started off in that building I mentioned before, uh, Building 20, and it was there, I think, that that paradox I mentioned earlier really got going. So first let me tell you about what happened in Building 20. Building 20 is, is actually has a fascinating history of its own. It was put up in 1943, uh, supposedly as a temporary structure. The architect uh, said it was designed to last for the duration of the war and six months thereafter. Uh, it was torn down in 1998, so it was somewhat more than six months uh, thereafter the war. Uh, but it, as a sort of a ramshackle temporary structure, uh, it had an advantage because everyone was very free to sort of hack the building. No one felt bad about putting a hole in the wall or rewiring things 
are, are doing interesting things to it. And Building 20 has a lot of great things. It was the home of like a, the first nuclear lab at MIT and the Research Laboratory of Electronics. But uh, it also hosted a lot of student clubs. And one in particular uh, turned out to be the, the hatching ground for hackers. And that was called the Tech Model Railroad Club, uh, which you pronounce as ac acronym is TMERC. Uh, believe it or not, hackerism was born there, and it was almost like the Rift Valley of hacking there in that room in, in Building 20. So if you were wandering around Building 20 in the late 1950s, you might come across the Model Railroad Club, and it would be a, a giant room with this huge, elaborate uh, display of toy trains. Now, I use the word toy advisedly because it was probably among the most sophisticated layouts you'd ever see. On top of the table was, as you'd expect, a very detailed, you know, intricate uh, train setup like you'd see in, you know, I guess in a department store at Christmas time uh, with, you know, very detailed, you know, little people and hills and, you know, uh, carefully painted trains and uh, on a very intricate track uh, layout. And indeed, there were people in the Tech Model Railroad Club that fussed over this endlessly. And, you know, they loved painting and getting trains and, you know, looking at train magazines and things like that. But then there was a, something else that happened at the Model Railroad Club, and that was the stuff that happened underneath the table. And the cohort that worked underneath the table was called the uh, S&P contingent. It stood for uh, Signals and Processing. And if you look under that table, you'd find an unbelievably intricate tangle of wires and cables and transformers and even telephone step switches and crossbar executors, which were donated by a plan from a, a grant from the Western Electric College gift plan, uh, Ma Bell's uh, 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 affiliation there. Um, other stuff was scrounged from a nearby junkyard. So that tangle was called the system. And the S&P group of the Model Railroad Club wired up all sorts of things that you never saw in normal train layouts. They had, you know, you could do all sorts of weird things to it, like you could use a telephone dial to specify which part of the track you wanted to run, and several people could run different parts of the track at different times. And it really was important to these people who worked underneath the table, you know, what you did with it over there is just how elegantly you hacked up what you could do with it. And I use the word hacked up very specifically because these people called themselves hackers. And I, I found this interesting because, you know, before that, I really couldn't find people using the term in that way. And I wondered where that came from. I never got a really definitive answer, but we do know that the word hack at MIT describes a prank you pull, like, uh, I guess, painting the, the, the dome there, or covering the dome with aluminum foil, or getting a car on top of a building, or, you know, or, or doing something even more inventive. That's, that's called a hack at MIT. And so it's partly that, and partly the idea of just like hack with an ax, because they used it in sort of a self-deprecating way, like saying, oh, I, I, I hacked on this for 12 hours. Uh, and you know, they used the term almost like a golf term in, you know, in terms of like a hacking away at, at something there. So uh, I was actually able to get my hands on some of the club newsletters from the 1950s, which were pretty interesting. They talked about their hacking. And one of them even included a poem written by a uh, Tamirk hacker named Peter Sampson, who was one of the, the key hackers. And it was sort of in the spirit of Walt Whitman, uh, you know, which is kind of fitting because some of the professors actually looked like Walt Whitman uh, back then at MIT. So let me read you one of this poem, this poem here, which gives you an indication of the flavor of the club. Switch thrower for the world, fuse tester, maker of roots, player with the railroads and the system's advanced chopper, grungy, herring, sprawling machine of the point function linolite. They tell me you are wicked and I believe them, for I have seen your painted light bulbs under the lucite luring the system coolies, under the tower, dust all over the place, hacking with bifurcated springs, hacking, even as an ignorant freshman axe who has never lost occupancy and has dropped out. Hacking the M boards, for under its locks are the switches, and under its control the advance around the layout. Hacking! Hacking the grungy, herring, sprawling hacks of youth, uncabled, frying diodes, proud to be switch thrower, fuse maker, tester of roots, player with railroads, and advanced chopper to the system. So, this was the kind of humor that was tossed around there of you know, these people who call themselves hackers. And it wasn't until 1959, really, uh, when this is going on for a while that MIT offered the first course that undergraduates really could take in computer programming. And it was taught by a fellow named John McCarthy, who later became a very legendary figure in artificial intelligence, and did look like a little like Walt Whitman. Now, the computer they used for this class was this big, 
IBM uh, 704 mainframe, and it used punch cards, right? And you know, if you remember anything about punch cards, looking around the room, I don't think many of you remember punch cards, but I'm sure you've heard of them. But you know, it, it was a system that was very unsatisfactory to the hackers, because you had to write your program and give it to a technician, and a technician would uh, then put the program onto these punch cards, which would be fed into the computer, which you, as a hacker, didn't get to touch. They only could, could touch it there. And that was quite unsatisfactory, because you really wouldn't get results back on how the program ran for like a day or two afterwards. And uh, you, know, you wanted instant feedback, and you didn't get it. So the hackers figured, you know, this just wouldn't do. And you know, they figured out, how can we get more access there? And you know, uh, after a few months, they got their wish. You know, Lincoln Labs uh, donated a computer called the TX0 to MIT, and it was put in a place where the hackers could get access to it. And they were even asked to do some of the system software for the, the computer and, and debugging and, and things like that. And they spent all their time there, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, and you know, they wanted to learn everything they possibly could about the TX0. And learning about it and impressing each other with what they learned became central to their lives. Now, very quickly, uh, as they were writing the, you know, the system software and other things for the TX0, it became clear that every program, and indeed every line of code, should be accessible to all. And nothing should be considered in any way proprietary. You know, if you had knew something about the way this machine worked, you really had to share it with everyone else. That was really part of the culture. So they, they wrote their programs on these paper tapes, and the tapes would be in a drawer uh, by the computer, and they belonged to everyone. Anyone could pull up the tape, and then they could work on the program, and they could you know, in, in improve it. And you know, if this sounds like open source, uh, it, it was. It was maybe it was the Ur version of open source there. And you, know, you would take it, and you would improve it, and maybe you know, the word would get out that you might have done it, but basically it wasn't yours. It was everyone's to, to work on together. So these original wizards so passionately programmed computers, they discovered previously unconceived uses for them. Now, uh, computer time was really expensive then, so people tried, in general, to uh, you know, minimize the time the computer worked on something. But with the TX0, these hackers had more time to do things, and they did things that were normally thoughts of a waste of time with computer. Like one person did a th something that was really the first uh, word processor. It was a text processor. He called it expensive typewriter. Uh, and you know, guess what? That was word processing. And someone else did a thing to do his math homework, and he actually handed his math homework work in to the teacher with something he'd worked on with the TX0, and the teacher gave him an F, saying computers can't do these things. So a couple of years after the TX0 got there, a brand new company, which uh, hatched from MIT, called the Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, was developing a, a mini computer called the PDP-1, and they gave the first uh, model to MIT, again, drawing on the hacker community to write software for it. And among the hacks the MIT people wrote was the, you know, the famous game, maybe the first video game, called Space War. And again, it was a collaborative enterprise where people wrote different things. One person wrote something which actually uh, you know, arranged the stars in the background of this sort of space thing where rocket ships shot at each other in a way that corresponded to the real sky. He called it expensive planetarium. Uh, but uh, again, Space War didn't belong to anyone. The concept of intellectual property just didn't exist for hackers. So after spending a lot of time with these hackers and comparing the way they thought of things with the way that the later generations of hackers did, I realized that they had some things in common, sort of a shared set of principles. And I tried to set them out in, in this book, Hackers. I called it the Hacker Ethic. And the very first principle of the Hacker Ethic was information should be free. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that in, in the sense that uh, you don't pay anything. Though, of course, that was the way things were because people just didn't pay for software then. That wasn't uh, a commodity that people paid for. Uh, but I think that the hackers meant that once something was created, it should be available to all and distributed by any means. Free meant freely distributed with no strings attached. So a uh, quick digression about this. My book was published in 1984. And Stuart Brand of the Whole Earth Software Catalog uh, decided to hold a conference inviting all the people in the different generations I wrote about in the book uh, to get together. A lot of them had just never met each other. And you know, he did this. He called it the Hackers Conference. And during one of the sessions there, Stuart kind of hacked 
that expression, information should be free, by saying that information wants to be free. And you know, that became actually a, a pretty popular and controversial way to describe how things work on, on, the, on the internet there. So that's, that's where that came from. In any case, the free flow of information was really central to hackers when they were hacking on the TX0 and the PDP1, and that remained so when the center of gravity in the hacking world moved across the street, basically, to Tech Square. That was where the artificial intelligence lab was, and that's where all the hackers actually moved from the, the Model Railroad Club uh, out there uh, when they got access to the better computers out, out, out there. And the people who ran the lab, Ed Fred, and Marvin Minsky, really encouraged the hacker community. They did a lot of work uh, for, the, for the place there. And it was a hacker paradise, and there were mighty wizards there, and they had very strong feelings about openness. When timesharing uh, came into M MIT, a lot of the hackers objected to it because uh, they didn't like the computer time parceled out. They wanted a direct access. And they also didn't like the idea of accounts with passwords. To the hackers, their password, and the password they felt everyone should have, was a carriage return. That, that was the way to go. And their feelings about openness even extended to physical systems. They hated locks, whether the, the locks were on computers or whether the locks were on doors. In some cases, they had administrators at TechSquare that would lock up cabinets or rooms that held spare parts or tools the hackers felt they needed, and the hackers felt that was just totally intolerable. So they engaged in what would be known as lock hacking. Some of them even took locksmith courses to learn how to better you know, crack the locks on doors and also to get certification to get blanks that you couldn't otherwise get. Now, one hacker at the time called David Silver uh, describes sort of the lock hacking, hacking days to me. And I want to read this quote to you because it's kind of amazing. So he said it was like a, an ultra highly clever warfare. There were administrators who have high security locks and have vaults where they would store the keys and have sign out cards to issue keys. And they felt secure, like they were locking everything up and controlling things and preventing information from flowing the wrong way and things from being stolen. Then there was another side of the world where people felt everything should be available to everyone. And those hackers had pounds and pounds and pounds of keys that would get them to every conceivable place. The people who did this were very ethical and honest, and they weren't using this power to steal or injure. It was a kind of game, partly out of necessity and partly out of ego and fun. At the absolute height of it, if you were in the right inside circle, you can get the combination to any safe, and you get access to anything. Now, he, he really wasn't kidding. Uh, in talking to the, the hackers from the uh, AI lab, uh, I, I learned a story where at one point the administrators uh, you know, felt they'd you know, ramp up the security. They got a class two safe, which is, you know, maybe some of you could uh, check on this, the kind certified for the government to hold certain kinds of classified material. And the hackers originally couldn't get through it. Then they found a similar safe in a government surplus yard out, out in Taunton, uh, not, not too far from here. And they took that safe, somehow got up to the ninth floor of Tech Square, and they took it apart with the acetylene torches to get a better idea of how that safe worked, and eventually figured out how to open the safe that the administrators have. So it could even be argued that lock hacking got out of hand at MIT. You know, the hackers could get master keys to everything, and of course, since they had certification, they got these blanks that people couldn't get, and some blanks are so secret that even certified locksmiths can't get hold of them, in which case they would like, use their keys they had to get into the machine shop and very carefully tool the master keys to the master keys, and they had a lot of keys that got into two-thirds of the doors at MIT. And once they actually seriously considered distributing a copy of these master keys to every incoming freshman at MIT, sort of as a, as a recruiting tool to say, like, you know, hey, come, come see us. We're really cool here. Now, the poor guy who had to protect things at MIT was the administrator of the AI lab. It was a guy named Russell Nofsker. And you had to feel for this guy. He actually sort of had some of the hacker gene himself. One thing he had in common with a lot of hackers, a lot of people of this ilk, for some reason, really love explosives. I don't, I don't know why that is. It's, it's something else in the genetic component there. So this guy, Nofsker, when he was young, he worked for a young, little, little younger, his job before, he worked for a company, it was a high-tech company, that actually allowed him to take part of his pay in Primacord, which is a very high e explosive. And yeah, you know, he, they like to tinker with that. And once he even like had an idea where he would, you know, it, it was a snowy winter and there was a lot of snow on his sidewalk, and he, he could blow the snow away by using Primacord. And his wife caught wind of this. This is sort of like a little, you know, lead motif in, in this talk, I guess, about, about wise. But uh, and she she put a stop to it. She made him shovel the walk. Uh, she didn't think that was a great idea. 
In any case, despite his very cool tendencies to, to, towards explosives loving, Nofsker got very protective, you know, when the hackers would get into the in things in the lab. And he kept, like, you know, ramping up the protection. It was sort of like Tom and Jerry, right? And, you know, and the hackers would, you know, like, then get through. Until finally, he didn't reach a solution. He just, like, threw up his hands and said, you know, that, that he was going to stand down. The problem, he figured, was the barriers themselves. The higher he'd make them, the more effort the hackers would take to knock them down. And, you know, he'd be embarrassed and, you know, uh, it, it just go on forever. So we, they reached sort of an unspoken agreement where the barriers w w wouldn't, wouldn't be so for formidable and, you know, the hackers would go where they wanted if they wanted to kind of climb through the ceiling and drop into a locked office, as they often did. Uh, and they looked, looked around. They really wouldn't hurt things. And it was okay as long as they preserved the illusion that some people had privacy. So if you went into the office and climbed through the ceiling and dropped in and saw what was going on there, that was okay as long as you didn't talk about it to people's offices was. And that, that really seemed to work. Now, it worked because it was a given that these hackers were honorable. Though sometimes their tinkering might crash the system, they weren't out to vandalize. Though they believed they should be able to see everything on the computer, they didn't take that information and abuse it or blackmail people. And sometimes the tools they used got broken in, in the, the, the term they used. They didn't mean for that to happen. The idea was to learn and to hack, and, and that's why they needed access to things, and that's why it was so important to them. Now, what I found remarkable is that some of that culture spread out past MIT, and that the culture of honor lasted really as long as it did. And what's more, uh, you know, the, the lots and lots of honorable people, call them the White Houses, are as passionate about it now as they were in those really intense days at MIT. Now, maybe the purest hacker of all that I met when I was doing the book was this guy who was, you know, virtually living at Tech Square, uh, and a fellow named Richard Stallman, which name might be familiar to you because he'd later go on to be the creator and the conscience of the open source movement. And, you know, back then, uh, he was the person who felt he was keeping the hacker flame there. So if you think about it with intellectual property, that same paradox I mentioned earlier really applies. It's great for society to have ideas and expression of ideas uh, running freely, but it's also possible that doing so can put a lot of people out of work, uh, like people in the music business, or even, dare I say, people in the publishing business, my business. But, uh, you know, it's amazing to me and refreshing to see that the views of, of, of Stallman and the uh, MIT hackers have caught on among so, at, so many. And the hacker ethic, um, I'm really happy to say, really does live on. So I, I can't really overestimate the importance of this mode of thinking on the development of computers. It really was, I think, the hacker model that shaped the way the PC works because, of the, as I said before, the homebrew hackers thought the same way. And I think the creators of the Internet, you know, came out of that culture. And, and, and that's one reason why openness was really baked into the Internet. And the idea really paid off. I believe because of people of that mentality were behind PCs and the Internet, we really enjoy all the benefits of computing that, you know, do so much for our lives today. But, of course, we have the other side, the woes that come from that vulnerability that's also baked in there. Now, you can't pin all of that on the hackers. Because some of the openness is just plain common sense. Making things accessible makes them accessible to bad folks as well as good folks. And the fact is, whereas a couple decades ago one could say the hackers were by and large honorable, it's no longer justifiable to say that that, that goes without saying. Uh, quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. So I remember when that worm began to turn. It was in the 1980s, uh, the mid-1980s, when the term hacker became associated not so much with, you know, the kind of Weizenbaum loser or the true hackers that were heroes, uh, you know, I call them heroes in my book, but the kinds of people who break into computers and vandalize and, and, and cause trouble there. I think the turning point was this group in Minnesota, I think it was, that broke into some government computers there, and, you know, uh, they were called hackers, and that, and that term sort of stuck and caught on from there, and the true hackers, uh, were outraged by this, by, by how the, the word that they took as an honor became polluted. And I remember we had these uh, subsequent hacker conferences that took place every year as an outgrowth of that original hacker conference. And there was one year where a reporter from CBS was there, and he was doing a thing on hackers, and he thought he was going to write about all these people breaking into computers. And the poor guy almost got lynched there, you know, because he was misusing the term. But uh, really, 
there's nothing you could do about it. Language really has a flow of its own, and it's, it's probably as difficult to control as it is to uh, control a, a movement of hackers. So uh, this was a battle that was really uh, destined to be lost. The term basically was just too useful to describe troublemakers and later thieves and virus makers. So you know, it really was a lost cause. And looking back, it's sort of quaint to think that that term itself could be salvaged, especially with what we see today. These days, we cope with realities like Russian hackers breaking into banks or the Chinese government uh, supposedly employing thousands of hackers to engage in cyber warfare and all sorts of horrible things. And if you think back to those days, you think, these are hackers? Oh, my goodness. And, you know, what, what, what's happened here? But fortunately, the real hackers, the true ones, are still around, and I find that incredibly encouraging. As a matter of fact, uh, as I wound up you know, uh, chronicling in, in, in a subsequent book called Crypto, the true hackers have had an incredible role in computer security. And in my book, uh, Crypto, I tell the story, and once again, returning to that same building, just a stone's throw from here, Tech Square, uh, and tell the story of a guy named Whitfield Diffie, who worked in the AI lab. Uh, he was a hacker, and uh, he really enjoyed lock hacking, but he also really enjoyed the other side. He enjoyed safes. He had a really uh, you know, fondness for a really good, strong safe. And he was interested in privacy, and he wanted to learn more about it, and he you know, knew about cryptography, but was uh, frustrated because he couldn't find out how to do sophisticated cryptography because all the good information was classified and you couldn't get hold of it uh, unless uh, you, know, you, you signed an agreement uh, to you know, keep it to yourself and, you know, uh, let, and keep it under government control uh, over some three-letter agency. Uh, and, he didn't want to sign that agreement. He didn't want to get in bed with a three-letter agency. Instead, he just drove back and forth across the country trying to find anyone who could talk to him about cryptography because he wanted to learn more. He had this real uh, fondness besides safes for dots and five tens. He would like buy one after another and leave the, uh, the old one on his lawn and, and uh, you know, sort of scrape it for parts afterwards. And you know, eventually, uh, his journey stopped at Stanford and he hooked up uh, with a guy named Martin Hellman, uh, a professor there, and the two of them invented public key cryptography. And uh, in crypto, I, I talk about you know, how public key cryptography really set the standard for uh, private security, and again, something that, that the hackers you know, uh, were responsible for. Now, also again in Tech Square, three guys who you know, maybe I wouldn't call pure hackers, uh, but, but, but certainly picked up on you know, what Diffie and Hellman did, uh, wrote the system that most of, of us used to implement uh, public key cryptography, RSA, Rivesh, Shamir, and Edelman were up there, uh, I think it was the fifth floor of Tech Square, and that's where uh, our RSA began. So, you know, again, all this uh, history within a stone's throw of where we are. Now, despite public key, and all those other advances, there's still a big cost in implementing these systems. No protection comes for free, and there's our paradox again. So that's why I think it, it is so frustrating that we have to have things like if you lose a laptop, a MacBook Air perhaps, uh, you won't be assured that all the information on there is going to be protected. Weirdly, we have systems that could protect it, but you know, time and time again we hear that the systems weren't protected. And that, that, I guess, says something about the trade-offs we have to deal with to get those systems to work there. Um, you know, so you know, people, I guess, lean towards accessibility for what's good for them and what, you know, can, in terms of what they use every day, but it also leaves it open to accessibility to other folks, which isn't so good. So if you even broaden the metaphor there, that paradox is something we have to deal with as an entire society as we deal with the challenges of personal security in you know, uh, coping with uh, post 9-11 uh, terrorism. Openness and, and, and openness and access let society thrive, but it also makes targets soft. Too tight a lockdown, though, oppresses us and stifles our crea creativity and productivity. So what do you do? There's no easy answers. But solutions, uh, you know, a way that can make the problems more tractable. At least I hope there are solutions. Now, sometimes we're over-optimistic about the solutions. Uh, I remember a few years ago, Bill Gates came to visit us at Newsweek. And he said, I want to come to Newsweek because I want to talk about spam. And we brought him in there and we gave him a cheeseburger. And he sat there in my editor's office while I interviewed him. And he told me how absolutely, hands down, no problem at all, there will be no spam by 2006. Totally eliminated. He, he, he promised me there. No problema, right? Uh, I think uh, Bill underestimated there. And, you know, again, that you know, just uh, illustrates that paradox, uh, how we deal with spam now. 
again, do we aggressively filter it out and keep our maybe some potentially valuable messages in a spam filter and never see them? Or do we open up and let our inbox fill up with uh, porn descriptions and pleas for widows who want to help us recover millions of dollars there? Now, uh, I really wish I could come and say that, that I have some ideas of my own in resolving this paradox. But I don't. I hope you guys have, have the ideas here. My uh, intent here was to tell you a little bit about you know, all the history and how that paradox was baked in, you know, just a stone's throw from here uh, in, in Cambridge, give you a sense of the history, and give you, you know, like a, a feeling for, for what happened without having to buy my books. There. Anyway, uh, I'm happy to take a couple questions here. We've got just a little time. But meanwhile, thanks very much for your attention. And I'll take questions on any of this. So, is there a hand out there? I've answered everything. Come on. Okay. Sorry. Why, why aren't we? Do, why don't we see the hacker mentality in uh, in the DNA space or the biology space or something like that? What was special about computers? I think, um, well, I, I, th I think actually we're starting to see some of that. I'm, I'm hearing more and more about biohacking. And, you know, though the, the, the term, you know, just gets people's backs up because it does sound a little scary. But I think basically the thing about computers is that it is a total blank slate. And it is something that really uh, a, a person can control very, very thoroughly. And, you know, uh, it, it gives a real sense of, 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 of empowerment. When you're dealing with a material, you just don't have the unlimited creativity you have when you program. You know, the, you, you don't start with a total blank slate. So uh, pushing around uh, uh, you know, ideas, really, uh, and, and, and creating algorithms uh, you know, is, is a freer arena, maybe, and can be endlessly hacked. Whereas if, you, if you're dealing with real stuff, I guess there's you know, just a physical limit to what you can do. That's just a stab at it. No one else? In that case, thank you again. Have a great show. Actually, thought he was, you know, one of the you know, key models for it. So, so he, he really took a personal there. Uh, and, but it, it was interesting to, to, to think back at that stereotype, which was, you know, incredibly uh, unappealing. You know, that the people would draw there. You know, there, there might have been aspects. You know, okay, maybe personal hygiene wasn't was one of the strong suits uh, there at MIT. But uh, it really misrepresented. I, I thought what was it? An amazing part of it is going on. Oh, thank you.